So welcome to my lectures for ethical hacking. This is going to be done out of the Pearson View Cert Guide preparing you for the CEH. So chapter one is ethical hacking basics. And when we say ethical hacking basics, we're talking more fundamentals, not actual hacking basics, but more security fundamentals. So some of our objectives are going to be after we read our this or after we go through this chapter, we're looking at the security triad, discussing the types of security testing, understanding hacking and cracking, motivations, describe the ethical hacker responsibilities, what's involved in test planning, and discussing ethics and the legality of our ethical hacking. So what is the security triad? Normally the security triad is CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And confidentiality is again addresses how the information is kept secret or kept confident. If someone obtains the information, their confidentiality has been compromised, so it's no longer confident. This could be done as simple as things like locking doors, fences, armed guards, keeping things secured area. Also could be uh, like passwords, encryptions, firewalls. So it kind of just depends on what area that we're talking about. Are we talking physical security, electronic security, and in any other combination there. With integrity, this addresses the correctness of the data. What's the likelihood that the data was changed in transit? Data must be protected both while being stored and in transit. If the data has been modified while in storage or transmission, is there a way to verify that that was on purpose or had a legitimate reason? Because the integrity could be compromised if the transmission or storage of that data wasn't changed correctly or on purpose. Next, availability. That's pretty straightforward. The data should be available when people need it. So normally a security fundamentals is Usability versus security. The higher the usability, normally the less secure it is. However, the more secure it is, the less usable it is. So with this, we have to think of some way to balance usability or accessibility and security. I can make something so secure and have no one be able to use it. But what's the point of securing it if no one is ever able to use it. Basic elements of our risk assessment, assets, threats, vulnerabilities. An asset is any item that has a value. That could be a in node, that could be devices, that could be secrets, that could be lots of different types of tangible and intangible objects. Threats, any condition that could com compromise an asset, this could include things like natural disaster, hacking, viruses, trojans, ransomware, anything that again, again, compromises an asset. A vulnerability is normally a weakness, something to exploit so that you can compromise an asset. The goal of security is to minimize the risk to an acceptable level. Not 100% secure it, but to, minim uh, to minimize or mitigate risk. So, for example, we minimize the risk of our car being stolen by rolling up our windows and locking the door. And for most people, that minimizes the risk of theft of their vehicle. Normally, for vulnerability, we see that if an organization is more vulnerable, there is the possibility of an increased risk of successful attack or penetration of that asset. Security testing. The primary role or job for an ethical hacker first is to do it ethically with written permission. Meaning you are going to try to gain access ethically and within the scope of the permission that was given to you. Normally for an ethical hacker, you would obtain written permission and you would outline the grounds 
for what is okay versus what is not okay. For example, an organization approached me to do a penetration test on their network. I then ask, what am I allowed to do? What am I allowed to access? That way I have a clear scope of things that I know that I can do and that I can access. That way, while in the process of doing my penetration test, I don't accidentally compromise something that I wasn't supposed to have access to. For example, they want to do a penetration test on their floor network and I gain access to their HR network. That's outside of my scope and I shouldn't be doing that. Also, within that scope, they may say that I'm allowed to cold call employees. They may also state that I'm not allowed to email employees. If I gain access via an email, then I, again, am outside of the scope that I was allowed to do. So, with ethical hacking, normally we look at different ways that they have knowledge. And that will define if they're a black hat, a white hat, or a gray hat uh, type hacker. Normally a black hat has no knowledge tests. That means they have no understanding of the network. And this will simulate an outside attack. It will have no prior knowledge of the target. This takes more time and is more expensive. But they have no knowledge of the network whatsoever. And their goal there is to, to get in. Now this is different from a black hat. We're calling this a black box versus a white box. And that is they have a full knowledge test. They fully understand how the network is designed. And they're looking more at vulnerabilities, not at the network itself. A gray box, they have some knowledge and it's more simulating an inside attacker from within the network. We are going to discuss white hat, black hat, and gray hat in just a few minutes, so do be patient. Types of security testing normally is a, a higher level assessment. And this is a top-down assessment of the organization's policies, procedures, and guidelines. And this doesn't always include hands-on testing. This could just be a policy and review assessment. We have a network evaluation. And that normally includes a hands-on test in addition to our high level. And lastly, we have a penetration test. And here we do a level 1, level 2, and we also attempt to compromise the network. However, normally a penetration test is done first, and then you may do the level 1 and level 2 type tests. That way, you could see where you were able to get in, and then you start reviewing the procedures and the policies as well as the network evaluation. Hackers versus crackers. They are different. A hacker, originally a computer enthusiast, now is individuals who break into computer systems with malicious intent. A cracker is a criminal hacker and they do this illegally, and they illegally hack into computer systems without permission. Normally, a hacker was someone that wanted to see that they could do it without malicious intent. However, the redevelopment of a hacker has now been with malicious intent. So an ethical hacker is an individually hired to perform security tests as well as vulnerability assessments. And this again, with written permission. Ethical hackers have permission. Here the key thing is without malicious intent, but they need to have permission. Normally these types of hackers, they're gonna have scare, uh, very uh, variable skills and knowledge. They're gonna have a more understanding of routing and switching, networks, operating systems, firewalls, things of that nature. And this isn't necessarily to say that they all have this, it's just they're going to have a little bit more understanding. And this isn't something that you immediately pick up and you do. These are developed skills over time. So modes of ethical hacking, 
could, could include like informational gathering, internal versus external penetration tests. That will stimulate an inside threat versus outside threat. Could also be a network gear test. So after you're looking at the routers and the switches, denial of service attack. That could be actually uh, denying certain uh, devices the ability to process requests, thus seeing what will happen. Wireless attacking, social engineering, physical security, database, so forth and so forth. Stolen equipment, also type of attacks. So these are just different ways that ethical hacking could occur. Rules of engagement. See, you'll notice I keep saying with permission. Normally, an ethical hacker will have a set of scopes. This is going to be the rules that they have to follow when testing. Again, always start off with written permission. Never go outside the scope that's limiting you. Normally, you want a non-disclosure agreement. Keep it ethical. Keep it documented. And keep in mind that whatever you do, all of this is confidential. The goal here is to do no harm while doing your testing. Ethical hacking test plans and phases could be, first of all, getting the scope of your project, defining, getting their approval, looking at any legal issues, then actually performing the assessment based off of your scope. Then afterwards, write up. Do a report. Show what you did. Show what you were able to access so that the firm that hired you could tighten their security. Ethical hacking reports, normally, they will submit a final report. They should include like an introduction, work performed, results, conclusions, as well as recommendations on how to fix key areas. The recommendation area is kind of subjective. Because sometimes you are hired to uh, test and maybe not recommend. Okay, so a question that's generally asked at this point is, who are the attackers? And the attackers could be hackers. They could be just kids learning how to play, normally called script kiddies. They could be uh, disgruntled employees. They could be someone uh, trying to purposely commit espionage against your company. They could be cyber terrorists. They could be government officials from another uh, country, which that's kind of also cyber terrorism, but that's more state-sanctioned cyber terrorism as opposed to corporate-based or monetary-based. So keep that in mind. Ethics and legal ramifications. You need to understand that within the U.S., there are lots of laws addressing hacking, like the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 84, Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, the Patriot Act, the Federal ISM Act, the Federal Sentencing Guidelines, the Economic Espionage Act, that's more for corporate espionage, Child Pornography Prevention Act, HIPAA, PCI DSS, there's lots of compliances and all kinds of rules and regulations dealing with this. So in summary, we talked about the triad, we talked about the basic elements of risk, the mode of ethical hacking, security tests, hackers, crackers, ethical hackers, the different types of test phases for hacking, basic laws, regulations, and compliances as a general overview. Now keep in mind this is just an intro. We have detailed lectures for a lot more of this in-depth coming soon. But I did say that we would talk about black hats, white hats, and gray hats. So a black hat hacker, normally called just black hats, are the type of hackers that popular media seems to focus on. These are hackers that violate computer security for personal gain, normally monetarial gain. A black hat hacker who finds uh, some type of zero day or first day uh, security vulnerability could sell it and be able to get money. 
that is different from a white hat. A white hat does this legally. They are more of the ethical standpoint. And again, with permission. A gray hat is more of a white and black combined because a lot of this is not black or white, it's heavily gray. So this could be a white hat hacker that sometimes goes a little, little bit in the black arena. And that's it for this chapter. I wanted to thank you guys and hope you guys have a great day.